All right, here we have another lesson. This lesson is actually devoted to describing this course in a little more detail. So, as we already pointed out, uh, this course starts off with a motivation, which is really adapted from a different talk I gave. But it covers a lot of the key features. Um, and this, this, these bullets tell you the different sections of the course. We describe the data deluge, the importance of having lots of jobs, industry trends, the fact that industry adopted clouds, an important interesting area for um, academia is the so-called fourth paradigm, which is so-called data-driven science. The fact that we used to have uh, observational science, theoretical science, computational science, and now we have data-driven science, where the data itself tells you what's going on. I mean, there are lots of really interesting examples of how you can just discover everything from the data without knowing anything like Newton's laws. Always when I was taught as a child, I expected to have laws. A lot of the progress over the last few years in areas like complex systems and actually um, data science have come from observing that you can make huge progress in fields which have no laws. There is no laws, uh, fundamental laws governing the stock market, um, how people rate movies, and how people buy things on the web. But you can still do a very quantitative study, and that data tells you enormous things. The fact that people rate certain movies higher or certain particular um, books higher than other books is extremely interesting and tells you things without any theory as to why books are good or bad. Then we have the actual process of data science. That's pretty important, because if you want to be a data scientist, you better know what the process is. And we then go to, to an area which we come back to in much greater detail in the class, the physics, informatics, looking for the Higgs boson. Say this particular overview just does some of the X's we have. We do recommender systems, which are used in the um, in e-commerce e or commerce informatics, we do web search, which is again a major topic of the class. We have a rather broad overview of cloud applications. And we do uh, this uh, core um, discussion of parallel computing. Everything these days is done in parallel. Um, and how MapReduce allows you to organize parallel computing computations. The final discussion of this particular motivation is why you're here. It's on data science education and why that's a super opportunity at universities and why you should university should be looking at doing this type of thing. And then we end up with some conclusions. Then we have these, uh, if you remember the previous slide, which had all the units of the um, of the course um, dis displayed. We have three units which are called X informatics introduction. What is big data, data analytics, and X informatics? And those, those three units cover all these topics here. Lots of stuff here. And it's actually not dissimilar to that motivation conversation for other obvious reasons. Because the, this was designed as the introduction to the course. The motivation was described was um, designed to explain to the general public why the whole field is exciting. So they're not slightly different focus. This is particularly devoted to the course. The other motivation um, uh, unit was devoted to uh, a rather more general goals. <laughs> and so we have we explain this critical rallying cry of, cry of using um, clouds to process big data collaboratively using data analytics. And then we have the why, why you should be doing it, so you get your job. We have the data deluge, all the fields which have big data. The process of data science, remember data-driven science is gonna change the world. We have examples like the internet and business applications. We have examples in science. We have this implication which we mentioned for the um, scientific method. An interesting area is the so-called long tail of science, and actually there's even a long tail of books. Maybe an interesting feature of the world we live in is that we have so-called big science and big books or whatever you want, which are very popular books like uh, those of, of um, Potter books, but there are also lots of lots of popular books. And a key feature of um, 
this technology, it actually exposes this long tail of books. Because if those long tail of books are rated well by people who seem to have similar likings to you, they will be told to you, and you will probably would never have found them otherwise. So this is more efficient, possibly, than searching through a bookstore. The Internet of Things, where there's by 2020, some 25 to 50 billion devices, going to billion devices going to be on the Internet is <coughs> an important aspect of data deluge. Clouds, of course, uh, the core um, infrastructure used to do all of this stuff. Uh, we describe some some general features of the data deluge, how you use that to process big data, what the data science process is, and what data analytics is. Here we have our side MOOC on Python. This is setting up, describing, this is not the place you go to to find out Python. It is just meant to describe those aspects of Python that you'll need for this class. And that is NumPy, numerical Python, Matplotlib, how you plot things in Python, and SciPy, which has these things like the k-means algorithm in it and statistics, which are the key libraries to do scientific computing. Canopy is the software that uh, we happen to use. There may be other software, it comes from a company called Enthought, and it's downloadable for free. After this, we have our four units on physics informatics. And uh, this has a lot of, as you, uh, we use this example to tell you about how to count events and the basic statistics thereof. And uh, we focus this <coughs> on the most spectacular example of this field, the discovery of the Higgs boson. And uh, look at the data which was exhibited for the first time that the Higgs exist. Uh, we have some rather general discussions about the monstrous, monstrous scale that physics is done with a single experiment having over 3,000 people. And then we have this thing from the past, how to count events and why if you count n events, the error is square root of n, and things like that. Then we actually demonstrate all of this with Python code, which generates events and counts things and stuff like that. We introduce some fundamental principles. I say we're using these examples to demonstrate um, technologies, in this case, statistics, random variables. We describe why random, how random variables are used in physics. Uh, we look at uh, normal distributions or Gaussian distributions. Many, many things in physics have Gaussian distributions because that's what you ha that's what happens if you just repeat the same thing many times and add up the results. And in physics, that often happens. We discuss how to um, generate random numbers on computers, what the generators look like, and how you put seeds. So you start the generator and always get the same random numbers. Or you can start the generators at uh, random points based on the time of day or what have you, and get uh, get um, so-called random, random distributions. We discuss various um, distributions of random numbers. The binomial distribution is the first one. That's the that's what happens when you toss dice forever. An important, slightly subtle method is called the accept reject method. That's how you generate uh, um, things or events or random variables with an arbitrary distribution. We discuss the famous Monte Carlo method, which is actually very important in physics experiments because you need to know what you might have seen. And we know what you might have seen by generating events which look like what you, what you observe and see how often you might have detected it. The trouble is these experimental apparatus in physics are so complicated. There's no rational way that you could possibly guess how in detail how Reliably, you will or will not detect a certain type of event without using Monte Carlo methods. And actually, the Monte Carlo methods probably use more computer time <coughs> than actually processing the data. But they're still sort of related to the data. The only reason you're doing these Monte Carlo methods is because you have data. Then we do another important distribution, the Poisson distribution. And finally, we go to the so-called central limit theorem, which underlies a lot of these areas of statistics.